Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. Today we are going to read Yukio Mishima. No, not today. We've already read it. We're going to talk about having read Yukio Mishima's book, The Sound of Waves. Because amidst this uh, shutdown due to this Kung flu, we're going back to basics, Carl. Where Do you mean COVID-19? Is that what they call it? Is that the scientific name? <laughs> I guess so. What's the scientific name for West Nile? I don't know. Or Spanish flu. I don't know. I'm offended by calling the potato famine the Irish potato famine. The Irish potato famine? I think it should just be the unfortunate events of the 19th century. Hmm. We should just not have any geographic names of anything. Well, since we're uh, we're hunkered down over here to try to keep from getting that the Chinese AIDS, we've been going back to basics. We've been cooking, playing some games, reading some more books, practicing the guitar a little bit. Uh, I just I recorded this morning and uh, took a little break and went and talked to Charity and said, "What have you been doing?" She said, "I've been playing ukulele for the cat." <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows? By the time this podcast comes out, maybe all this will be done. And you'll say, look at those silly people talking about that thing. But uh, one of the benefits of hunkering down, there's a line in this book that I liked. Something like, the, the lighthouse keeper lives in solitude. There's a lighthouse in this book. We'll talk about it. And the solitude had enabled him to forget Men had bad motives. Yeah. Something like that. Is that a good thing to forget? <laughs> it's a good thing to be able to forget, I guess. To set uh, aside for a time. Yeah, and just think, look, if you are, if we are still hunkered down and this thing comes out, do some of that stuff that the busyness of the world makes you not be able to do. Hmm. And I want to dilate on that point for a minute. <laughs> dilate. <laughs> yeah. Back in a long time ago, and I was reading Augustine's Confessions, checking a bit of it in Latin. I didn't read it in Latin. I I read a, a little bit of it in Latin. But the word for business in Latin, so the word for leisure is otium, O-T-I-U-M. The word for business is negotium, mm. not leisure. It doesn't have a positive name. It's just not the stuff that you should be doing. The stuff you should be doing is spending time with your family, talking with your friends. You might have to do it online if we're still hunkered down, uh, playing ukulele for the cat. I have a cello here. I touched it the other day. I've been real busy. I, I played a few scales on it. That was nice. Are you like, a, what was it, Stringfellow Hawk? What was the guy's name on Airwolf? Do you remember? Do you ever watch that show Airwolf like a million years ago? <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> no, I'm not that good. That's the sort of stuff that's the best stuff in life and having enforced retreat from the not leisure from the business is your time to figure out what sorts of things are really good yeah and if i would say don't do netflix and chill or at least don't do it very much because that's just going to fill the gap in your time with more gap in my opinion <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about this on our Slack channel. It is kind of a golden age for TV, but even so, how even TV at its best, how good can it be? Right. Like I don't a, think it's all that good. Golden age for junk food. Who cares? But it also expands. It it takes so much time. You know, if you're going to watch a whole season of something, that's, what is that, 13 hours? Could be. What good things could you do in 13 hours? What better things could you do? You could learn to paint. You could get a Bob Ross thing. Oh, that'd be awesome. And paint happy little trees. My trees would be mad as hell. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Yeah, we're working on a t-shirt, old books and chill. Yeah. You you dropped a line in Slack today that I think needs to be on a shirt too. OGB, we ruin your life in a good way. <laughs> well, a, a guy was, we have a music podcast. I'm sorry, we're doing a little prep thing here. Uh, but Michelle Hawkins you might have heard a few of these already. We are doing a podcast with her, or she's doing a podcast and letting us join her yeah, on music and ideas. She's also doing a seminar for those that want to do it on online great books. And I dropped in for a little bit the other night 
and it was good. It was really interesting. A whole bunch of people talking intelligently about Mozart who'd probably never listened to him before, or at least not with any sort of depth. And somebody posted on Slack that it's making him feel guilty for listening to pop music. <laughs> and I don't know about that, but you might feel guilty about listening to so much pop music. You know, every now and then you want to put something in that's that's light and easy, but you shouldn't realize it's light and easy. Well, he didn't say guilty. He said it ruined it for him. He said he thought it sounded complex a week ago, but it's starting to sound a little childish. Well, he needs to listen to more Rush. Well, he said he really... Okay, listen, you're going to make me read this whole darn thing. Did you? He says, I really enjoyed music and ideas and what I was able to catch in Michelle Hawkins' first seminar, but I feel like you guys are going to ruin pop music for me. I'm a big fan of metal, prog, stuff like that, and even things I thought sounded complex a week ago are starting to sound a little childish. Hmm. He must mean yes. He doesn't mean, he doesn't mean Rush, right? He just means yes. Yeah. Rush is authentically complex. Right. Authentically. No, it's not that complex. It's just more complex than most of the stuff. Yeah, or Electric Light Orchestra. What else could he be listening to? Early Genesis. Ugh, I hate all this stuff. So bad. <laughs> 70s art school students discovering rock and roll. Yeah. And doing it completely theoretically. Yeah, so uh, if you are hunkered down, if we're still um, movement restricted... This is a, a this can be a blessing to go find some of these better things and do them. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a watershed moment, Carl. Uh, I, th I don't think it's the big one. I don't think it's the big one. Um, but I think it's going to do a great deal of damage to uh, the economy, whatever that is. Uh, I think there are going to be layoffs. I think there are going to be financial hard times uh, ahead. And uh, I think that people are going to have to simplify. I think we're going to going to have to simplify and find things that give us longer lasting pleasure and deeper pleasure and maybe are inexpensive. So practicing that guitar that you've had laying over there gathering dust is uh, one of those things. And uh, uh, reading a book, playing cards, touching your cello. You said you touched it. It's a little weird. Well, I got a cello. They got a cello for Christmas. And I've played it like five times. Mm. I'm working about four or five jobs right now. Right. <laughs> It's the gig economy, bro. My daughter Grace has been playing it, so it's not lonely. It's not abandoned. Right. I just haven't played it very much. I'm having my other daughter, so now that I'm saying this publicly, I'll have to do this. I'm having her write us a string trio. Ah. Oh. So uh, one daughter plays the violin. One has taken it upon herself to play the viola because only interesting people or bad violinists play the viola. Viola is the French horn of string instruments. Yeah, that's a good comparison. And so... Uh, and I've got a cello, and I told her, these are the four notes you can have me play. You can have me play the C, you know, the G, the D, and the A, which are all the open string notes, and and write a 16-measure string yeah. trio. That's good. And then we'll play it. That's going to be our plague response. That ain't bad. You guys need to record that. <laughs> It'll be fun. I have to push her to finish it. I told her I'd give her $1 American if she finished American. it. American. She's like, yeah, no, thank you. She wants <laughs> She's like, crypto, you got crypto only, right? <laughs> I'm completely baffled by this whole thing. You know, the stock market's down, you know, 30, 30 some percent. And uh, I think it's going to leg down another 35 percent, by the way. I'll say it publicly. Uh, gold and Bitcoin are down. Hmm. What's going on? That's counterintuitive. Hmm. 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 I don't know enough about that stuff. Somebody's got their thumb on the scale. But today... <laughs> We have Yukio Mishima in our hands. Mishima is a Japanese fellow, if you couldn't guess. He was mm -hmm. born in 41. He died at age 45 as a, a fallout from the Mishima incident. How awesome would that be, Carl, if there was something that went down in history as the shoot incident? I hope it wouldn't involve me committing ritual suicide. He and some of his uh, his his buddies tried to overthrow the... I guess it's the Marshall Plan government that we installed after we nuked them over there in Japan and to re and tried to reinstate the Sun Emperor. <laughs> and it, it didn't work out. And, uh, and he had written his uh, suicide poem, as all good samurai do, and um, committed seppuku uh, as a result of the failure of the plot. Or maybe the whole plot was like a ritual run-up to his... Uh, beautiful suicide, which would be interesting to a hardcore right-wing Japanese aesthetic. 
Yeah, I try not to let too much of thinking about that uh, get into my looking at the book. Because I, <laughs> That's a good I had idea. heard about the guy. So I'd heard about the guy. Well, I looked on Info Galactic. I looked at his page. And, and then I said, no, I don't want to know anymore. I'm just going to read the book. And the book is delightful, oh. charming, wonderful, beautiful. Hmm. And if you go to it and say... Oh, this is the guy that tried to overthrow the Japanese government, and and you know, <laughs> you're, you're looking for that in the book, right? right and so. I I didn't want to look for that in the book. I wanted the work of art to stand for itself. And Mishima, he did whatever he did for whatever his reasons were, but the book's still good. The book's good. Uh, he was nominated for the Nobel Pro- Prize in Literature three times. He is not an insignificant uh, literary character. You know, he's kind of the. Uh, how about this? He's the Akira Kurosawa of. Japanese literature. Mm, I think he's the Hayao Miyazaki <laughs> of Japanese literature. Okay. <laughs> judging from the one book that I've read. So Miyazaki, if you don't know, um, if you like movies and you like animated movies, you ought to know Studio Ghibli and Spirited Away and some of these other movies that have done. What I really like about Miyazaki's films is he'll take time and he'll just show people doing things in daily life, which you see here. I mean, this thing starts with two pages of just describing the island before you meet anybody. And he'll talk about them pearl diving or cooking the, the, the fish or just as little details of daily life on this little fishing island. And Miyazaki does this in his movies. There'll be like five minutes of just showing the mother making breakfast. Mm-hmm with no dialogue, beautifully animated. And and the thing about animation and writing uh, is that every word is intended to be there. So it's not like a film if you have a camera running and you could just run the camera of somebody making bacon and eggs in the morning. Uh, you have to like do every frame of it or do every word of it. So if you have scenes like that, it's intended. There's something about the value of the everyday that I saw in, in this book that reminded me of Miyazaki. Yeah. A lot. When I said uh, Kurosawa, they, he sees a, a deep beauty and um, a profoundness in their tradition yeah. and in their traditional aesthetic. I'm always really interested. This is a piece, a piece of fiction, and I'm always really interested in the first sentence in fiction. Because the idea, you know, while you're, you know, you take your writing class and they tell you, you know, you need to really hook them. You know, you get, get that hook. That first sentence needs to call me Ishmael, whatever. Well, this one says, Utajima. Song Island, has only about 1,400 inhabitants and a coastline of something under three miles. I was like, I could go for this book. Does this sound like an appealing place? Yeah. Yeah. And it's an island. It's an island. He describes the island and he describes the going-ons there throughout the entire book in this very, what seems to be like a very Japanese way. You know, if you see one of these old Japanese woodcut prints, you know, of the waves and for cherry trees and blossom and so on. They have this very pared down aesthetic where they, they display just the most important elements of the subject. They don't really have a realism tradition like we would in Rembrandt or something like that. They've always been very selective about the reproduction of reality in their art. And this book is like that. It reads like one of those, one of those woodcut paintings, you know? Yep. Yeah, with the characters, you get you get very little of inside the characters. There's not a lot of internal monologue. My daughter asked me if I was going to mutilate all the Japanese names because she yes. took a little Japanese. And I said, yes, absolutely, I am, because I'm from Illinois. Uh, so Shinji is the boy. Mm. And Hatsue, I don't know how to say that. See, I don't know how to say it, is the girl. And you get very little of what they're thinking. It's, you get what they do. Like pictures of what they do. So here they are coming down from the lighthouse hill. Here they are over there, you know. They're like those woodcuts. They're just these little beautiful vignettes. Listen to this. Now, of course, we're reading this in translation. He, he would have written it in Japanese. Just now the needles of the surrounding pine trees are still dull green from winter, but already the spring seaweeds are staining the sea red near the shore. It's almost a haiku. Mm-hmm. And the book's just full of these little lines, these vivid, vivid little pictures about using the telegraph on the ship to shore radio, <laughs> the girl he had never seen before resting against a stack of heavy wooden fl- frames lying on the sand. 
the kind called abacuses because of their shape. Her forehead was moist with sweat and her cheeks glowed. Period. Yep. Love it. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect little book. Now, I like this first moment when they meet. So this is on page eight of my edition, which is... Uh, I think it's the only one you can really buy. Vintage International Division of Random House. So page eight. So the boy sees this girl. He's like, I think he's 18. So he's a young fella. She has been off the island, but her father called her back, readopted her, which is an interesting story. He had adopted her out because he'd had enough daughters. <laughs> and then he got lonely and brought her back. Uh, so there's a new girl in town and she's beautiful. Of course, she doesn't know it, but she's beautiful. Which is the most beautiful. Right. She doesn't figure it out. The boy purposely passed directly in front of the girl. In the same way that children stare at a strange object, he stopped and looked her full in the face. You just imagine this kid it's like staring at her. The girl drew her eyebrows together slightly, but she continued staring fixedly out to sea, never turning her eyes toward the boy. I just think that's funny. She knows she's being looked at. And he doesn't care that she knows he's looking. Shinji-san, the boy, just doesn't care what other people think. He works because he likes to work. Uh, he has the virtues he has, and uh, he wants to st stop and look at her. And so he stops flat-footed right in front of her and looks right at her. He's almost like a, a man of nature in this book. Yeah. He doesn't know how um, – good-looking is not the right word because, in, at least in this book, the value of a man is not solely in that – um, but he doesn't know how good looking and good he is either. Neither of them know. Yeah, he doesn't realize how attractive he is in his virtue. Yeah. Which here for Mishima in this book, I think, is his work ethic, his strength, and his bravery. And and his conscientiousness too. You know, the, the kid's conscientious. He he brings his friend the lighthouse keeper fish on his way home when he can. He does things for his mother and other neighbors when he can. He's he's conscientious with his employer that runs the little fishing boat he works on. He's a he's a conscientious citizen. He's a good kid who doesn't think he's anything special. Yep. He doesn't know that he's a he's the prime catch on this island. But he's poor. So his father had died in I guess in, in the war. Killed by the Americans, I presume. Yeah, it actually says he was. He was killed by a bomber. Yeah. So it's just his mother and his little brother and him on the island. She is the daughter of the richest man on the island. So, you know, that's never going to work. Is this a Romeo and Juliet story? Uh, no, I like, I can't pronounce that guy's name. Teru, her father. Mm. I like her father a lot. I actually I wrote too. next to his, his description that this is the Scott Hambrick of Song Island. <laughs> I'll take that. I like it. Uh, but her dad owns two ships. Not fishing boats, but like... Cargo ships. Yeah, cargo ships. He he doesn't suffer fools. He knows all the history of the island. Uh, he's kind of gruff. Everybody respects him, but, you know, they don't mess with him. I bet he would sit and tell you all about the stock market. <laughs> And <laughs> and it's going to get bad. I can just imagine him holding forth. Uh, some guys in a similar the, way. Some guys in the bath, like they, everybody goes to a bathhouse to bathe. It. Th this is a poor. This is a poor community, at least monetarily. Seems rich. Seems like a lovely place to live to me. Um, but you know, boiling water or heating water, and you know, having doing baths at home is just something that people can't really afford to do. They don't, and it's too onerous. They don't have hot water tanks at their house and water heaters and boilers and stuff. So everybody goes to the bathhouse, including the richest man on the Island. And, and at one point he goes to the bathhouse and there's somebody talking trash about his daughter. Mm -hmm. Rumors and, have started uh, flying. He, he whoops their ass, <laughs> yeah. which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a bit more about Shinji. So he doesn't know um he doesn't know how good he is, but our evidence for how good he is is just in a few little lines. So one of them's on 19 and this is an image that's going to come back. He's looking out at the sea. So I I reread this this morning. Dang it. I skipped through it this morning. I'd already read it. And uh noticed this bit about the freighter. So he sees a freighter out on the horizon. This is page 19. 
when the day's fishing was almost done, the sight of a white freighter sailing against the evening clouds on the horizon filled the boy's heart with strange emotions. From far away, the world came pressing in upon him with a hugeness he had never before apprehended. The realization of this unknown world came to him like a distant thunder, now peeling from afar, now dying away to nothingness. So he's looking out at the sea. I was trying to figure out what the imagery of the sea meant as I went back through it this morning, because the book is The Sound of Waves. Mm -hmm. So here he's looking out at the sea, and he's being hit with the hugeness of the world, which means the smallness of him. And so that white freighter comes back in at the end, only has a different response, having gone through all of this. And and, uh, I suppose I'll, I'll save that for the end, but... Uh, right now, he feels very small. Yeah, but he doesn't get up in his head, though. He doesn't get all emo about it, because it <laughs> follows, right? Right. He, he, the lines right after that says, a small starfish. This is more this Japanese aesthetic. A small starfish had dried to the deck in the prow. The boy sat there in the prow with a coarse white towel tied around his head. He turned his eyes away from the evening clouds and shook his head slightly. Yeah. That's his reaction to this feeling infinitesimal. Yeah, what if he'd had an Instagram account? He probably would have t- took in a picture. That's what they say in Wisconsin. Taken a picture took in it. Yep. of the uh, starfish or something or a selfie of him and said, gosh, I feel so, I feel so insignificant and uh, adulting is hard. <laughs> Or something like that, right? right? He he might have been weepy and then tried to find people to confirm him in his weepiness. But he doesn't have time for that because there's fish to catch. Yeah, he has a plan. He he wants to learn all he can about fishing. And he wants to save his money. He wants to help mom because he has a little brother and father's dead. But he wants to save his money. He eventually yeah. wants his own little boat one day. Yeah, I want to go to his prayer at the end of the next chapter. This is page 25. And he goes up to the shrine. He's seen this girl found out that th- there's some other boy that's likely going to marry her. He's done a little detective work. First, he didn't even know who the heck it was. Uh-huh. So he had to do a little snooping around, listen to the village gossip. And he doesn't want anybody to know that he's interested, so he can't just come out and say, who's yeah. that good-looking thing over there? He can't do that. So he's spying, and he figures it out. And then he makes this wonderful prayer, and and it says... uh. Uh, God, let the seas be calm, the fish plentiful, and our village more and more prosperous. I'm still young, but in time, let me become a fisherman among fishermen. Um, And he asks for skill in that. He says, protect my gentle mother, my brother who's still a child. Uh, Oh, yeah, I want to do the other line. He says, let me be a man with surpassing skill in everything. I love that. I love that prayer. Let me be a man with, you know, I want to be good at stuff. He wants to be good at stuff. And then he adds at the end, someday, let even such a person as me, because he doesn't know how good he is, be granted a good-natured, beautiful bride, say, someone like Terakichi Miyata's returned daughter. He's not praying for her. He's praying for someone, you know, kind of like her. Yeah. Um, And then at the end, he says, but mightn't the gods punish me for such a selfish prayer? Oh, how could you not like Shinji? Yeah. He's so cool. I remember, I want to bring something else up. I we have started watching in our hunkered downness, um, dirty jobs. Mm, yeah. Micro. And uh, there's this one where he goes out to Maine to hang out with the lobster fishermen. And, uh, he goes on the boat with these two young guys and they're like, I think the oldest is 19. It's like 18 and 19 and a 16 year old. And he's on the boat with them going to get the lobster pots and he finds out that they own the boat <laughs> what you right I, i've seen how old are you right <laughs> is this your only boat no we own another one it, these young guys who are out there already owning their own means of prosperity and working it and and uh they were uh shinji doesn't have a main accent but <laughs> He has a uh, Song Island accent, I guarantee it. Yeah. It's a neat kind of a person, you know? And if you're were, if you the sort of the sort of person who gets all up in your head, and then you see somebody who's actually gone out and, and saved his money and 
and made an investment and is making money and doing things, you know, that's a different kind of a person. That's a, I don't know, I think we could use more of them. People of action. Yeah. He's at home after this prayer, and his mother says, uh, hey, I've gathered up some firewood, and we put it in the old observation bunker at the top of the hill. Apparently, the ladies of the of the village would gather up twigs and brush and so on and bundle it up, and they would store it in this old observation tower. This is probably no more than 10 years after the end of World War II, I think. It doesn't really say what year it is, but something like that. She says, I've tied a red rag on the brush I gathered up. Go up there and bring that home for me. So he goes, goes, and um, and she's up there, crying, crying. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, so she'd gone up to the lighthouse keeper's wife's house. The wife gives etiquette lessons or something, but. I guess she was early and she went wandering around and got lost. And so now they get to meet and uh, it's like the answer to the prayer. Uh, yeah. He had never dreamed of such a fortunate meeting and could not believe his eyes. So the two of them simply stood there, startled like animals that come suddenly face to face in the forest, looking into each other's eyes, their emotions wavering between caution and curiosity. Finally, Shinji spoke. You're Hatsui-san, aren't you? And then he says, it was you crying, wasn't it? Yes, it was me. Why were you crying? Shinji sounded like a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> He's not much of a flirt, this guy. No, there's no artifice about this. He, there might be a little artifice with her, but there's none with him. Uh, and uh, so they have their, their enjoyable time. Uh, what? Actually, now he's completely ruined. As he's Yankee tormented. Did. Yeah. Look, when's he going to meet her again? I like that the next time he he meets her is out when they're trying to pull the boat. They can't do it. So the, everyone's gone home. They're trying to pull the fishing boats on, and there's not enough people to do it. And the ladies are out trying to push from behind the the boat. And uh, yeah, every night they heave the boats completely up on the bank, up on the shore. And they, they, they float the boat up on this frame. They call it the abacus because that's what it looks like. And, it has, and then they throw, throw rollers under that frame, and then they try to roll it up the beach and get it clear of the water. So if there's a storm, wind, et cetera, it doesn't damage the boats. And the fishermen, they pretty much leave. They run up on the bank. They grab their catch. And because there's no refrigeration or anything, they run. I don't know if they run, but they, they quickly distribute their catch to wherever it needs to go, and they leave – uh, they leave the the boats handling of the boats in the evening to the ladies of the village. That's just the order of business. And uh, he walks up and they're struggling to get one out of the water. And he just tugs on the rope and pulls it out. So there you go. There's more of the the his excellence that he doesn't know he has. Mashima writes about his hands often. He has big, big, strong hands. And they're creased from the pulling on the ropes and, and the work that he does. And they talk about how dark his his skin is from being uh, for being out in the open sun uh, in the boats during the day. He's just a big, strong, strapping kid. And uh, for Mishima, that's a beautiful, virtuous thing. Yeah. But while he's out there doing that, he drops his wallet. Mm. Oh, this is the prayer, right? So the girl finds the wallet and comes to the house. Oh, he ran off to look for it. And then she goes back, and then they meet again. And his first words to her are, this is 41, I hear you're going to marry Yasuo Kawamoto. Is it true? <laughs> That's the first thing he <laughs> says to her. I heard you're going to marry somebody else. And she's laughing at him. But then they kiss. And it's the first experience in his life, is how it's described. It's a... Uh, Sorry, it's just really good. It's the good. first experience in his life. Yeah. Tastes like seaweed, he said. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, so here you get some of this sound of waves. So I, I noted this down. Um, whenever you hear the title, for me, that's something of note. So in the next chapter, now that his life is ruined, or at least stirred up. Ruined in a good way, like we do with pop music and 
pop culture here at right, OMGB. Right, right. He heard the sound of waves striking the shore, and it was as though the surging of his young blood was keeping time with the movement of the sea's great tides. Uh, it was doubtless because nature itself satisfied his need that Shinji felt no particular oh. lack of music in his everyday life. So there's a couple things in there. The, yeah. the sea is moving him, but it's all he needs. Um, but I was thinking of this. So we did Schopenhauer last week, which, dear listener, you had a chance to listen to. And he talked about um, romance as being the working out of nature's plan. And it's not always what you think. It's not always a rational choice. You know, it's not like the boy decided that he was going to try to marry the daughter of the richest guy in town. Mm -mm. He just, all he had to do was see her. You know, and then, um, and then that's it. It's as inexorable as the tide of the sea. Yeah, he certainly wasn't looking for it. I mean, he was just thinking about helping his mother and his his younger brother and saving saving his money. And, um, in learning his trade, that's the only thing he was thinking about until that day. That he so what does he see in her? Well, there's a lot of boob talk, Carl. <laughs> there is. There is a lot of boob talk. Apparently those yeah. are pretty good. Uh, he just thinks she's just lovely. Well, actually, um, Shinji doesn't ever say anything about it, but, but Mishima describes what she's wearing and how she's sort of serene and composed in, because Shima describes her that way. I assume that's what Shinji is seeing and liking. Mm -hmm. uh, toward the evening that day on page 47, even though no etiquette, less, etiquette lesson was scheduled, Hatsui came visiting, bringing a door gift of some sea cucumbers wrapped in newspaper. Here we go. Beneath her blue serge skirt, she was wearing long flesh-colored stockings and over them red socks. Her sweater was her usual scarlet one. She always is dressed simply, and, and and Mishima always describes what she's wearing, but he never describes what anybody else wears except for the the other guy that wants to marry her, marry her mm -hmm. because he has a leather jacket. <laughs> so if you were filming this, because I guess we, we all watch movies, if, if you were filming it, you might have everyone else be in sort of muted tones, and then she's the one who whom you notice. Yeah. You know. And then right after we, she describes the red socks and the, the flesh-colored stockings, the etiquette teacher says, when you wear a blue skirt, Atsui-san, you ought to wear black hose. I know you have some because you were wearing them the other day. Well, blushing slightly, Hatsui sat down beside the hearth. So this is why I think. Is she completely without artifice? She's wearing the red socks. She knows what's up. Look at me! <laughs> Well, she's a little bit forward with Shinji. I, I would say she's a lot forward. If I if she had done some of those, yeah, yeah, she's a lot forward with Shinji. We can talk about that. But she's considerate. She goes back, like she'll clean up after the party when nobody asked her to. She just gets up and starts cleaning up the plates at the lighthouse keeper's wife's little get-togethers. What does she see in him? Hmm. I think it's his capability. You know, that day on the beach, he just pulls the boat up on shore. Uh, another time she's lost and he helps her find her way. I, I think she just likes his, his, his masculine virtues. Yeah, uh, there's also the one time, where he, the longest speech that he makes in the book, I think, is page 53. As uh, the, I think they're walking back from the lighthouse keeper's house. And did you ever think that would be the job that you would prefer? Lighthouse keeper? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All you got to do is turn the light on at night. And live far away yeah. from other people. What's not to like? They're mostly automated now. But he says, uh, they're walking and it's quiet. And so finally, the quiet is so much that it makes him talk. This is page 53. As for me, someday I want to buy a coastal freighter with the money I've worked for and saved. And then go into the shipping business with my brother, carrying lumber from Kyushu and coal from Kyushu. Then I'll have my mother take it easy. And when I get old, I'll come back to the island and take it easy too. No matter where I sail, I'll never forget our island. It has the most beautiful scenery in all Japan. In the same way, I'll do my best to help make life on our, on our island the most peaceful there is anywhere, the happiest there is anywhere, because if we don't do that, everybody will start forgetting the island and quit wanting to come back. Uh, and a little bit later, talking about the island, 
the sea. It only brings the good and right things that the island needs, keeps the good and right things we already have here. That's why there's not a thief on the whole island. Nothing but brave, manly people. People who always have the will to work truly and well and put up with whatever comes. People whose love is never double-faced. People with nothing mean about them anywhere. And she doesn't interrupt, and she just looks. Her face overflowed with an expression of genuine sympathy and trust. That, I think that's what she loves about him, right? That speech, that's where she decides she's going to marry him. How could you not? You know, he, he loves his homeland. He loves the people. He thinks they're the best people in the world. He wants to keep them the best people in the world. And he purposely omitted the last important hope that he had included in his prayer to the sea god a few nights before. Yeah. Well, it can't be too obvious. Yeah, I think she loves his clear vision of what he wants and his masculine virtues. Yeah. I wrote a note here on this monologue that he gave. Is this Japan? You know, I'm trying to read the book just as a love story, but it can resonate with some other things. Japan is an island with a its own culture that has striven pretty hard to keep it mm -hmm. as it is. I don't know how well they've done, but... Better than many. But Mishima's talking about his love of his homeland here. Yeah. Their walls are made out of rice paper. Yep. You know, uh, crime and unrest is is unheard of. This book is a Edmund Burke's delight. Oh, tell me why. Because the young people aren't looking for something different. They're not looking for change. It's, it's not like, don't trust anybody over 30, and they don't get it, man. They appreciate what they have there, and they want to excel within it and to have a part in it. There's not a reformer in this book. Pete Townsend wrote, I hope I die before I get old. Right. Well, he's old. And Shinji's talking about what he wants to do when he gets old and how, how he wants it the same when he gets old. They all appreciate, except for the lighthouse keeper's daughter, the order that they have here on this island and the beauty that's there and the simplicity and uh, the peacefulness. The daughter, Chiyoko, of the lighthouse keeper has a crush on Shinji and is a bit upset when she sees them walking down and she starts spreading stories. They had a tryst up there at the old observation tower. They didn't. They well, were virtuous. They but were it looked like they did. Hey, listen. Well, we won't spoil it. Right. <laughs> they had a encounter of, of sorts. And they come down the hill hand in hand. And uh, the jealous uh, Chioko, who has, a, uh, has terrible self-esteem and, and, frankly, a little bit of a poisonous outlook on the world, slanders them and spreads rumors that they have done untoward things. Right. And so the father shuts it off, and that's the dramatic tension for the rest of the book. Will they get, will they make it, these two kids? What they don't do is blow up all of the societal customs on the island to make the love happen. She's like, well, don't lose hope, but my dad won't let me see you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some things have to happen in order for this to proceed. But what doesn't happen is let's blow everything up. You know, let's just run away and elope or let's just... To me, they're kind of boring. Of There's so many movies of coming to age where the coming to age involves shitting on everything that went before. Right. It's an easy way to make an art movie nowadays, it seems to me. And sometimes they don't do it all the way, but a lot of the time they do. And... It just, it's boring to me. You know, this has been done. You know, where's the one where, you know, they figure out that their family aren't monsters and that the culture they grow up in is not crazy. It's a bunch of people working out a way to deal with the problems of life. Right. Yeah, Shinji would certainly would like for her father to give them his blessing and for it all go smoothly. But we, we're not privy to his inner dialogue in this book. But I think that he... When when that doesn't happen, I think he thinks, well, I'm but a simple fisherman. I need to uh, learn more about being a fisherman, and I have this stuff to do, and uh, her father must not believe that I'm up to the task. So probably I'm probably not up to the task. Poor Shinji. Well, how would that be wrong? Well, I like his approach to it. It's not, woe is me, or who is he to tell me? You know, it's like, I'm going to go do my job. I'm going to go do the best I can. I'm going to be the best Shinji Kwa Shinji <laughs> that I can be. You're mixing Japanese and Latin. I, I, uh, 
I want to I want to shinji the hell out of this, and it'll be it'll be as it's supposed to be, whatever that may be. His mom is interesting on page sixty eight, Carl. So I'll tell you guys. Mishima's kind of a boob guy. A lot of boob talk in here. Apparently. My daughter read this book, my 16-year-old daughter, and she was laughing about that. She didn't get it. It's like, it's... let me tell you something about guys. <laughs> <laughs> we got legs, honey. We're not interested in that so much. <laughs> it's not lurid talk, though. If you read this, it's no. not lurid. Uh, it's not even distasteful, but he clearly, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal to him. <laughs> um, but then at the bottom of 68, Shinji's mother, who is a widow, her husband died during the war, um, doing his job, by the way, not um, not as a soldier. He was in a fishing boat, and it was strafed by a bomber, and it got killed. She's evaluating her own self there at the bottom of page 68 and the uh, top of page 69. She says, finishing the dishwashing, she opened the wide, wide the skirts of her kimono and sat down with her bare legs stretched out in front of her, gazing at them earnestly in the dim light from the creaking windows. There was not a single wrinkle in the sunburnt, well-ripened thighs. Like this, I could still have four or five children more. But at the thought, her virtuous heart became filled with contrition. Quickly tidying her clothing, she bowed before her husband's memorial tablet. Yeah, interesting. She's not going to go have more kids. Out of piety? Yeah. To the dead husband? Out of uh, devotion to the dead husband, which ultimately ends up being devotion to the children. Yeah. You know, you know, if she remarried and had another litter, who would be there to support Shinji and his young brother? You know, we see it time and again, you know, somebody remarries and uh, they have another litter. And now Shinji and Hiroshi are kind of on their own. I don't remember where it is in the book, but the scene where she goes up to do the memorial. There's a couple neat things about that. The, the gravestones described, I think, as like the white caps of the waves. Yeah. Uh, but she's trying to. I don't know all the details of the ritual, but she's trying to light candles. She can't. The wind just keeps blowing them out. So she's kind of ineffectually trying to honor her dead husband. And and nature is conspiring against her. I've been driving around in the cemetery with aforementioned 16-year-old daughter, letting her drive. It's been, well, this is before all of the plague stuff. But a uh, big Catholic cemetery near us. And... It's been windy and cold, and, and but there's all these little decorations that people go to put out in front of the gravestones, but they're all getting blown away, and it just, uh, they're trying very hard to hold on to their deceased, and yet nature's not cooperating, and, and so the, the cemetery workers have to go clean it all up and pick all the stuff up that's blown all over the place, and it just, it's melancholy to me, and that was what this was reminding me of. Yeah. Uh, Mom's virtuous, though. Well, should we talk about Yasuo's dastardly deed? Sure. So the boy, fat Yasuo, he's described as being chubby. Also wealthy. And wealthy. He thinks now he's read too many pulp novels, you know, with those lurid covers on them. He thinks that once the girl is a cracked pitcher, which is an expression they use, like if she's... <laughs> no longer virtuous that means she's fair game and so he is going to grab her and have his way with her the cracked pitcher thing that's remember that's because um the lighthouse keeper's daughter spread a rumor which was not true right i thought it was interesting that if he was successful in his dastardly deed she wouldn't be able to tell anybody right if he failed she could tell her dad interesting to me is a little bit of a cultural thing that her reputation is such that if he should succeed she'll have to protect her reputation by not telling on him that's some perverse incentives there i think yeah we don't have to beat around the bush here it's sexual assault fat yasuo uh, he tries to rape her really yep. and uh, is foiled gets, because of the hornets <laughs> yep he gets stung by a hornet yeah Otherwise, uh, he would have been successful there. Who knows how the story would have turned out. Shinji getting a, his father's katana. No, I'm just making it up. Maybe. Yeah, I was a bit worried at that point that it was going to be this kind of book. Mm -hmm. That it was going to get very dark. But it didn't. It didn't. Well, I really like, I really like 
uh, Terakichi's approach here. So he finds out. Now it's obviously clear. The rumor's gone out that uh, his daughter is a, you know, so-called cracked pitcher. Um, he cracks the two kids' heads together in the cracked bathhouse. Pitcher. I got to tell some Hamburg stories. All right. I, I yes, read please. that. Cra- I read that cracked picture pitcher thing. My dad says, <laughs> "Torn overcoat pocket for the same thing." Yes. I have another friend named Gene who's about ninety years old. He says, "Busted valise." Hmm. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it, they're somehow parallel. They're exactly the same thing, you know. 70 years and uh, 6,000 miles away. Gene is from New York City. The 90-year-old would have been the same age, right? Well, that's true. And he's, But he's from New York City, and my dad's from here. Yeah. Interesting. So Terakichi doesn't say anything. He just... I, I hope I'm saying his name right. Well, Her dad. Knows. Yeah, the dad. I want to read the description of him. This is on page 106 in my edition. It might be better to say that Terakichi was a personification of all Utajima's toil, Utajima's the island, Utajima's toil and determination and ambition and strength, full of the somewhat uncouth energy of a man who had raised his family from nothing to wealth in a single generation. He was also narrow-minded enough never to have accepted any public office in the village, a fact that made him all the more respected by the leading people of the village. The uncanny accuracy of his weather predictions, his matchless experience in matters of fishing and navigation, and the great pride he took in knowing all the history and traditions of the island were often offset by his uncompromising stubbornness, his ludicrous pretensions, and his pugnacity, which abated not a whit with the years. (laughs) But in any case... It gets better. He was an old man who, while still living, could act like a bronze statue erected to his own memory and without appearing ridiculous. I love that paragraph. Yeah. I love that paragraph. That That's a guy that you could like, right? But you wouldn't talk trash about him. He's the embodiment, the embodiment of the, the virtues of that society, the virtues of the people and the environment, too, of the sea and the seashore and the fish and the wind and the rain and everything. Just love it. Right. What do you think of that line about being the bronze statue erected to your own memory? <laughs> well, I know some people have tried that, but the stinger on there without appearing ridiculous. That's the trick, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, this is uh, to drag Uncle Aristotle into it. This is like the that virtue of magnanimity in Aristotle. It's this virtue of the important great man who knows it. Mm. And so you have to kind of act differently and and you have to forget the benefits you give to other people, but remember everyone that they give to you. Uh, our friend John Pascarell, if he listens, he'll correct me on any of that, but Terakichi is the biggest and best man in the village, and he knows it. Yeah. But it's not ridiculous. It's not ridiculous because he actually earned that through his virtues, which are spelled out here. Right. And he explicitly says he didn't get it through any political means. It's strictly through his wisdom in the things that matter, which is fishing, navigation, weather predictions, history and tradition on the island, uh, his pugnacity. He says his ludicrous pretensions, which just makes him a character. You know, it makes him recognizable. He's the greatest man on the island because of all these good things, not because of any wrangling or intrigues or anything like that. It's because he knows what the weather's going to be like in two days. He doesn't ever get his, he never loses a ship. And people can trust the guy to, to be exactly who he is. Mm-hmm. Which, and Shinji's the exact same way. He just hasn't got the experience yet. People can trust Shinji to be exactly who he is. He'll be Uncle Shinji in about 50 years. Yeah. Terakichi never rinsed his body before entering the pool. What a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, as always, he walked in long, dignified strides directly from the door to the pool and without further ado, thrust his legs into the water. It made no difference to him how hot the water might be. Terakichi had no more interest in such things as the possible effect of heat upon his heart and the blood vessels in his brain than he had in, say, perfume or neckties. (laughs) Neckties. Yeah. Yeah, I've known a few guys like that. Yeah. He doesn't have time to be bothered with the weather. Some guys in the bathhouse are talking trash about his wa- his daughter being a broken pitcher. 
Uncle Tiru Miata really must be in his second childhood. He doesn't even know his girl's become a cracked pitcher. He gets mad. He stands up, takes a wooden basin in each hand, fills them at the cold water tank, walks over to the two youths, poured the icy water over their heads without warning, and kicked them in the back. The boys, their eyes half closed with soap, immediately started to strike back, but then they realized it was Terakichi they were up against and hesitated. The old man next caught them both by the scruff of the neck, <laughs> and even though their soapy skin was slippery under his fingers, dragged them to the edge of the pool. There he gave them a tremendous shove, burying their heads in the hot water, still grasping their necks tightly in his big hands. Hands are a big deal. Boobs and hands. The old man shook the two heads in the water and knocked them together just as though they were rinsing out the laundry. Then to top it all, even without washing himself, Terakichi stalked from the room with his long strides, not giving so much as a glance at the backsides of the other bathers, who had now risen to their feet and were left staring after him in blank amazement. I love it. <laughs> this is like Odysseus and the suitors, except they didn't end up dead. <laughs> he knocked their heads together like coconuts. Love it. <laughs> So we have to figure out how's it going to end. And if you've gotten this far and haven't read the book and think you are, you want to, you might want to pause until you finish it. By the way, let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, the edition I have here in my hands is 183 pages long. When you read this book, it's going to read pretty quickly. It's deceptively childlike, I would say. The sentences are short. The concepts are delivered on a platter. Think of it like a haiku. Look for a little more. There's nothing wrong with reading it and just enjoying the story, taking in a little vignette about you know Japanese fishing village life or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's more here than that. So when you read it, and, and I really think you should. I think it's just a delight. Know that there's a little more to it than that. I think a precocious seventh grader could read this, even though there's some boob stuff in there. It's not a big deal. Uh, and really enjoy it. Uh, I read some books when I was a little kid, like My Side of the Mountain. I don't know that one. Uh, Walt Disney ended up making a movie about a little boy, about a little boy that kind of runs away from home and just like roughs it and lives by himself on his own virtues and stuff. It, it kind of reads like some of these like children's hatchet. You heard of the hatchet stories, novels, mm -hmm. same kind of thing. It kind of reads like that, but there's, but, but it ain't that. I read Tom Swift when I was a kid. Tom Swift read that. Yeah. 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 Making his own rocket ship. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. I think it's a, on the surface, it looks like it's on the surface. Yeah. But it's not on the surface. Well, it's the Japanese aesthetic of manliness in here that I see I... that is ultimately, I think, attractive. But I think that's what Mishima is trying to put forward. And Shinji, you're, how could you not like him? You know, how could you not like Terakichi? He's not the bad guy, even though he's the one standing in the way of the marriage. And I love the way that they resolve this. Who are the bad people in this story? Yasuo and Chiyoko. Right. And they're the worldly people. Chiyoko has been gone. Uh, Yasuo wears a, a radium dial watch that glows in the dark and a leather jacket. You know, th these are the people that are bucking, bucking the system. Chiyoko is off in Tokyo in school. In school. Yeah. And Yasuo, um, wants to use like his his family connections and his material wealth to get this girl. Frankly, he's entitled. He feels like he's entitled to her. And uh, they're the only bad characters in the story. And everybody else is is somebody you'd like to have as a neighbor. Chiyoko is kind of bad. Yes, who I don't have much use for. Ch Chiyoko is super bad. But she's got this idea that she's not pretty. And, and so she's resentful. But she gets completely won over. All that happens is, so she's going back home. Or, well, she's going back to Tokyo. And uh, she meets Shinji. And she just says to him, this is on, in my book, it's on 117. Shinji, a am I so ugly? What? The boy asked, a puzzled look on his face. My face, is it so ugly? Shinji's answer was immediate. Being in a hurry, he escaped a situation in which too slow an answer would have cut into the girl's heart. What makes you say that? You're pretty, he said, one hand on the stern and one foot already beginning to leap the leap that would carry him into the boat. You're pretty. As everyone well knew, Shinji was incapable of flattery. Now, pressed for time, he had simply given a felicitous answer to her urgent question. The boat began to move. He waved back to her cheerfully from the boat as it pulled away, and it was a happy girl who was left standing at the water's edge. Can't you just see that as a painting? 
just a happy girl standing at the water's edge and the and, and waving. And all he did was say, "You're pretty," and because he is himself, she knows he's not lying. Yep, he's incapable of it. And I love that that he's getting into the boat. So you get this picture. This is that haiku ness of it, right? It's the picture of Shinji doing what Shinji does, which is get in boats and go off and do stuff. And he's in a hurry. <laughs> he's like, "Am I pretty? Yeah." <laughs> Or, or no, am I so ugly? No, you're pretty. I got to go. I, I got to go uh, uh, tend my nets or something. And it, it's just a wonderful picture of the both of them without a whole lot of words. It is like a painting. Shinji's mother goes to uh, Hatsui's father's house. She's tired of this talk. She knows she's already talked to Shinji and she knows Shinji because as mothers know, loves this girl. And she goes in there to talk some uh, sense into Terokichi. He won't even meet with her. She's a good mom. She's a good mom. And, uh, and he won't even meet with her. He knows what it's about. He's Terokichi. Yeah. He knows what it's about. So pretty soon, Shinji is invited to be an intern on one of Terokichi's coasting freighters. He has a captain that works for him. Terokichi has a captain that works for him, and, and the captain has been talking to people in the village and went and, went and goes and talks to the uh, the man who operates the small fishing boat that Shinji's been working on and invites him to take on this, I don't know, midshipman's position, some sort of intern. I don't know what it is. An apprentice job on this coasting freighter. You live very far from the ocean. I do. Yeah. Although there's a port near you. There is. Uh, and he takes the job and the other dude that takes the job is fat Yasuo. <laughs> yeah. I love this. I love this. So like he's in his house and this woman comes storming in. I want to see you. I don't want to see her. And so the daughter comes out and says, he, he, he won't see you. Well, he knows what it's about. He's got this problem to solve. Terakichi is going to solve it in a particular way. All right, let's get both these boys, put them on the boat. See how they do. I choose to believe him setting up this test was brought about by mom storming the house. Yeah, I think so. But he couldn't He couldn't let her know no, that. No, no. <laughs> no. I think that spurred him to action, though. And uh, he puts them both on the ship. And uh, we won't talk about it. Well, maybe we can. Whatever you want to do, Carl. But he does a great thing. They call it the great thing. That great thing you did. Shinji does a great thing. Uh, what, on the boat? Yeah. Have you seen that? They call it the great thing you did. And he doesn't think it's a great thing. Uh, it's a, what is it? There's a cable that he has to go and tie. They're caught in a storm. Yeah, there's a, essentially like a typhoon. They moor the boat with several cables to a buoy out in the middle of the bay. They wanted to get out, be out in the middle of this bay far enough. They wouldn't be battered against the shore and broken up, but not in the open water. So they... And they didn't have time to get moored where they want to be, so they moored to a buoy, and one of the one of the cables broke. Yeah, and so they need to go fix it. And so the captain is is uh, looking at his young sailors. Who's going to do it? So this is on in my book one sixty one. Which one of you fellas is going to take this lifeline over there and tie it to that buoy? The roaring of the wind covered the youth's silence. Don't any of you have any guts? Yasuo's lips quivered. He pulled his neck down into his shoulders. This is like a turtle. Like, I'm not, uh, don't, I'm not volunteering. Then Shinji shouted out in a cheerful voice. And as he did so, the white flash of his teeth shone through the blackness to prove that he was smiling. I'll do it. He shouted clearly. Good. Go ahead. So Shinji uh, is off to do this crazy thing, which I can't imagine being a landlubber myself going. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. But the description of it on the next page, the typhoon was directly above the boy's gallant head. It was as right for Shinji to be invited to a seat at this banquet of madness as to a quiet and natural afternoon nap. It's no big deal. He, That's what sailors do. He was made for it. Yeah. He doesn't think it's this great thing. Uh, and I, my note was how good it would be to be like that. You know. So this is the, the image of, of manliness that Shinji presents to us the stuff hits the fan and you just go clean it up you know you just you do your stuff you know what to do in a particular situation and you do it and you don't complain about it 
there was some danger in this for sure. Oh, certainly. But it needed to be done. And you just go do it. The way it's written, you come to believe that they would have lost the boat if someone hadn't got it tied back off. Yeah. So he did a great thing. But he didn't think it was great. No, he got home and he went to worship at the Yoshira Shrine to give thanks for a safe return. Then on to Jukichi's, where he had been immediately invited for a celebration. Over the protest of the boy who never drank, his sake cup was filled many times. Two days later, he once again went out fishing on Jukichi's boat. Jukichi's just the simple fisherman that runs the octopus pots. Yeah, I like Jukichi too. He's describing, he says, don't go fight Yasuo. <laughs> the rotten fish will show up sooner or later. All of his metaphors are sailing and fishing metaphors. Which is an interesting bit. You get people in a job, uh, real people that aren't all in their head, and you talk to them, and they will be just as they can be just as poetic and just as deep as anybody else. But their imagery is going to be local, mm-hmm. and it's fun. You know, which is why I I enjoy hearing, uh, you know, what they say in Katusa. <laughs> I think it's I, it's not. I'm not laughing at it, making fun of it. I think it's wonderful to hear how different people. Talk about different things. Torn over coat pocket. Uh, that could be another podcast, as they say in Katusa. Mm, got a bunch of them. Yeah, he does this great thing, and then he just goes back to work on his small boat again. He's not worried about, does he get to go back out on the big freighter again? Yeah, let me throw in a line there about his work that he does as a fisherman. This is in 167 for me. The work fit both his body and soul perfectly, like a well-tailored suit, leaving no room for the intrusion of other worries. That's funny. That's exactly the one I was going to read. Yeah, I read it better. You did. I agree. (laughs) The strange feeling of self-sufficiency did not leave him all day. You know, when you're doing the work you're supposed to be doing, you know, everybody everybody talks about this shit about like a flow state. There, there were all these like pop psychiatry books about, or pop psychology books about, you know, working and getting in a flow state and People talk about that, you know, and they're over there working in a cubicle on the TPS report or, you know, like trying to figure out why some cell won't populate on a spreadsheet or some shit, you know, and they're all seeking this. But I think there has to be a physical component for the uh, to the work uh, for you to reliably get into that, reliably get into that, because we're the joining of the mind and body. We're both. We're both and we're not just one or the other. And I think if you really mm-hmm. want to be immersed, you need all of it. There are certainly times when you can be reading or thinking or writing and, you know, you do get into that flow of thing. But if you're splitting firewood and it's just frosty enough that that water's expanded in that wood and, it, and it's splitting good, uh, you can look up and you forgot to eat lunch. And I found that that sort of thing is much easier to get lost in when the work fits both body and soul perfectly like a well-tailored suit. Right. I think that's right. My family we went to... Tennessee, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, I think. And there's this one little valley you can go into that's pretty much like it was. And you can find a cabin from the late 1700s. Some guy went out there with an axe and built a cabin. He's got spring right behind it, cleared some land, did some farming. And you look at it, and if you're a modern person who's all up in your head, you can look at it and say, how horrible. Now, of course, I, I would want penicillin. Yeah, penicillin. If I'm going to go back and do that, I want some of our modern stuff for sure. But to wake up in the morning, to have a whole line of work to do, to get it done, to go to bed knowing you've done a good day's work, to be surrounded by your family, this is not a bad thing. No. Uh, if we're if you are a cubicle dweller, it's a little hard to get that because you're not sure that you've actually done anything, and you can sit there around three thirty in the afternoon which is when bad things happen and and start thinking, what am I doing with my life? And then you start thinking about the self over and over again. 3.30 in the afternoon. That's the witching hour for Carl. It's the hard time to get there. If you can get to to cocktail time, you're in good shape, which is like 5.01. Right. (laughs) You know, my grandmother, my mom's mother, would have been 100 years old on Sunday the 15th, the Ides of March. And she didn't make it to 100. But I was talking to her oldest son, my one of my, my, my good uncle, my Uncle Everett. And I said, hey, your mom would have been 100 on Sunday. And he said, yeah, that's right. He said, you know, I'm really old. <laughs> I said, my kids are old. Like his oldest daughter's 51. 
said, my kids are old. He said, I think I'm the oldest living cousin. And uh, I said, remember you told me one time that if you started to slip, tell, tell you we were going hunting and just let me get out in front and just blast me. I said, you remember that? <laughs> And he said, yeah, he said, yes. I, I said, well, have you, have you been losing your keys? Is everything okay? You know? And, <laughs> and he said, yeah, it's fine. I said, well, how old do you want to get? This goes to work. This goes back to work eventually. And he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know. He said, but your aunt Pat, I'll be go out, going out to feed the cattle. And your aunt Pat says, I don't like you doing that. You're going to go out there and have a heart attack one day. And he said, I certainly hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he wants to do. Right. He wants to work. There's a bit in the Republic about, you know, about medicine and and treating people gingerly and, and making them invalids. And, and uh, Socrates says something like, you know, these people would know. They, they're just going to go, they might go see the doctor and then they're just going to go back to work. And if they drop dead, whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but this is the life that's worth living. And you're going to live the life that's worth living rather than just gingerly try to preserve a life not worth living. Does that make sense? Yep. If Shinji were a real person, he'd probably still be, he might be old, he'd still be alive, but he'd be out fishing. Hatsuri would be there with all the grandkids or the great grandkids. Would those boobs have held up? Uh, I'd like to think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really liked, uh, so the women of the island, there's some interesting things about the women. The women all work together. Uh, I, they're diving. What do they dive for? Well, they're pearl and abalone divers is the best I can tell. And uh, there's a line earlier about, so when Hatsui does something really nice for Shinji's mom, that uh, this is 146, it was in this same fashion that the politics of the island were always conducted. The politics happen when the women get together and do their stuff. Yeah. And the men are off fishing. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, they have a uh, diving competition. You know, I, I've read about these divers, these free divers. You know, the best free divers in the world are all women. There's something about their metabolism that they can hold their breath. They can, they can go deeper hmm. than men can. Maybe they don't use as much oxygen. And they seem to be more resistant to the, what is it, the nitrogen um, embolism. So you can go, look, you know, there's in Asia, in the Pacific Rim, there's a big tradition of women who pearl dive and they'll jump out of the boat with a stone and let that stone just drag them, you know, 60 meters deep mm. with no scuba gear, with no nothing. I'm getting claustrophobic. Yeah. Women can do this with some training and, and like no man can do it. And that's what these women do. So there's a door to door salesman kind of guy has some uh, trinkets and fabric and things that uh, he comes up to the women and says, I'll give you guys this here. I'll give you a, uh, I'll give one of you one of these little purses here uh, whoever's the best diver and we're going to dive for an hour or 30 minutes or whatever the heck it is. And whoever brings up the most goods off the bottom, I'll give them this gift. Shinji's mom is probably the best diver. At least she thinks she is. And, and young divers aren't as good as the older divers. There's some skill, there's some skill and probably some uh, physiological adaptation that takes place over time that makes these people, uh, makes these women excellent divers. They can go deeper without getting the bins and they can hold their breath longer. And lo and behold, uh, Shinji's crush wins. She beats the mom, and she gets she's given a gift, and she hands it over to Shinji's mother. Shinji's mom wants this for a daughter-in-law. She's in. Yep. She wanted Shinji to have what Shinji wanted because she cared about him. But now she's smitten too. Yeah, and then Chiyoko does a nice thing now that she's happy. She says... You better get them together. I don't know what I'll do. She sends a letter to her mom, who's a lighthouse keeper, lighthouse keeper's wife. And so all the women, <laughs> and I think the scene makes me laugh to think of it. All of the women go to Terakichi's house. They rounded the woman's slope. Like there's a landmark in the town they call the woman's <laughs> slope. But they're described like a flock of waterfowl. And so you imagine like the one goose and then a whole bunch of geese following just swimming up to Terakichi's house. And and he probably saw them coming and uh Can you imagine? He knows. He's like, oh Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and he lets them come in and make their presentation and cuts them off. Like if that's all you have to talk about, it's already settled. Shinji's the one I'm adopting for Hatsuri's husband. It's like I can imagine him like yeah, this is all settled. They don't know. Should I let them talk? Yeah. 
<laughs> They've gone to all the effort to present themselves to him. I don't know. It's an entertaining scene for me. Because, he says, the only thing that really counts in a man is his get up and go. If he's got get up and go, he's a real man. And those are the kind of med we need here on Utajima. Family and money are all secondary. Don't you think so, Mistress Lighthouse Keeper? And that's what he's got. Shinji, get up and go. I don't know what the Japanese word for that is, of course, but whatever it is, gumption. Shinji's got it. It was proved on the ship. And it's just beautiful. I want to go back. So that Sound of Waves again is 177. We have the Sound of Waves. Now that things are good. Nor was the sound of waves strong, but coming regularly and peacefully as though the sea were breathing in healthy slumber. So I I was reading this like a Schopenhauer would read it. I was thinking, well, there's all the urges of nature driving them forward. But now he's got the girl. And now it's calm. And I, I don't know that Mishima ever read Schopenhauer. <laughs> I actually wouldn't be surprised. He, I think he probably might have. So they go to the Shinto sh- uh, shrine And Hatsui had bowed her head and was praying against the white background of her kimono collar. The nape of her suntan neck did not look particularly white, yet it charmed Shinji more than the whitest of white necks could have done. Because even though her father is wealthy, it's wealthy for Song Island. She's still Mm -hmm. a diver girl. Yep. She still goes out on boats with all the women and strips down to probably nothing and dives down to where the water is really cold and the pressure's immense, and brings up food. And then they, they there's, some, there's some description of this in the book. And they, when they come up to the top, gasping for air, the other women grab the, and drag them into the boat and cover them up with blankets. It's cold. It's, they're so deep that they almost get hypothermia. This is no white-necked, white-limbed city girl. Right. He sees the freighter again. It no longer makes him think, you know, of the immensity of the world. This is on 168. Uh, So he sees the white freighter trailing its long plume of smoke through the late summer dusk that quickened his heart even more than had the unknown. This is the one that earlier in the book had made him think of the immensity of the world in his own smallness. The boy felt again in his hands the weight of that lifeline he had pulled with the last ounce of his strength. With these strong hands, he had certainly once actually touched that unknown at which he had previously stared from a great distance. He had a sensation that now, by simply stretching out his hand, he could touch that white ship out at sea. So there's a nice parallel in the beginning of the white freighter, and here you have it again. But now he knows he's got his own strength, that he can that he can do stuff. The very last line of the book, you like the first line, I like the last I line. Too. Uh, Hatsui is thinking, oh, it was my picture that protected him on the boat, because he had a snapshot. There's a funny line where he says to Yasuo, Fat Yasuo, oh yeah, you're... You and she are sweet. You got a picture? He didn't have a picture. But the girl is being romantic and thinking it was her picture that protected Shinji. But at this moment, Shinji lifted his eyebrows. He knew at it, it had been his own strength that had tided him through that perilous night. The end. Perfect little book. Perfect little book. Tight as a drum. I can't imagine. I would love to be able to read it in Japanese. Uh, I'm sure it's just, the, just tight as a banjo string. Not an extra word. Well, that, just wonderful. That's a project. You better hit Duolingo. Oh, I, I just love it. Like I said, it's a Burkean dream. Where these people that live there understand the virtues of the system in which they live, and they're appreciative of it. I think that probably has something to do with Shinto, you know, and that ancestor worship stuff that they have going on there, which I don't know a whole lot about. Well, just the phrase ancestor worship means... <laughs> You know, you're going to have some appreciation for what came before you more than you might under some other system. Perhaps. Yeah, I had a student once. So I used to have them read back in the old days when I worked in one of the universities that's now closed and doing everything online. Which, by the way, hmm. if they're able to do everything online, why'd you have to go in the first place? Well, I can't wait for kids starting to uh, start to ask for refunds. That's coming. Yeah. This guy's a smart kid um and i remember having discussions he asked once why tuition costs so much and i said because there's financial aid right <laughs> he didn't expect that answer it wouldn't cost as much if there weren't financial aid but we would read the iliad we would read the aeneid and he said you know filial piety's filial piety is really important to you isn't it yeah 
Yeah, it is. I guess it is. You know, he had seen it and I hadn't noticed it in myself, but I think it's important that you know where you came from, not that you have to imitate them, but you ought to respect it. Mm -hmm. You're not the first generation that lived on the earth. Everybody else had to solve all the same problems that you're solving, which, uh, what do we do at online great books? We're reading old books by people who are long dead you know, they, heck, they were 18 once too. Yep. You're not the first person to ever fall in love. You're not the first person to ever worry about your job. It's been done before and having some reverence for that might help you through it. Yeah. I want some stasis. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to my Barbell Logic Coaching Academy class the other night and um, we finished up our lessons and we just were just chatting. And I think about this a lot, and I, I've been thinking about it even more on the anniversary, 100th anniversary of my grandmother's birth, that my life is so different than hers was. She would have very little advice to offer me at this point. You know, what do I do about my podcast audience, grandmother? <laughs> you know, whatever. If all the material circumstances of life change from generation to generation, and they don't all change, but let's just say for the sake of argument they did. Like 100% of everything changed. Then my experience is completely irrelevant to my children. I'm unable to transmit my wisdom or my culture to the kids because everything has changed. Well, what if 25% changes? And that's probably about right. I was born in 74. I mean, it's a lot has changed. And the, the more things change, the more difficult it is for us to relate to younger people or younger, younger people to relate to their grandparents. It's harder for us to transmit culture. It's harder for us to give our progeny, posterity, uh, the benefit of experience because our experience becomes irrelevant. I think that a good and just society has an obligation to protect the material circumstances in the place as much as they can, thereby ensuring that your experience as a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent or a trusted uncle or aunt counts for these younger people. And, and it's not about me. My kids need help dating, right? They need <laughs> the help that, that Shinji and Hatsui get. But how can I help oh, I have them a young, when they're swiping a, left and swiping right and they won't even date? Uh, See, these kids won't even date. Like what? what is courtship like in 2020? They can't even tell me. The kids can't even tell me. No, they don't know. They don't I have know. a young... No, I don't know anybody knows. But I... I have a, a, I have a young relative nephew. Couldn't ask a girl out for coffee. It'd be too weird. Be too weird. That's not what you do. Hatui. It's all done on apps now. You know, it, it just, they don't know what to do. Right. And so I don't know if you're going to slow down the material change. I think eventually it's going to slow down because there's only so much you can do. Right there's now. a diminishing returns on, on this stuff. Uh, I, I would say it with a little bit different emphasis. Yeah, filial piety is real important to me. I don't know that you can escape the changing of material conditions. But that means that you should hold on tighter to the spiritual conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The traditions. Not that you have to do everything your grandfather did, but you ought to understand what he did. Mm -hmm. You ought to reverence what he did. Uh, at least the good things that he did. You ought to know your history. Have you even heard anybody say courtship? In the last year, I hang out in in uh, to the extent that I hang out with anybody. It is in Catholic homeschool circles. So yes, yes, okay, I have. Okay, but I mean that concept is just almost completely gone. And then people say, "Well, I'll divorce," and uh, well, no shit, really. You think? Yeah. The the vetting process is busted, but I'm, without getting into a big rant about that, like we really need to be careful. Uh, we need, well, how about this? Let me be positive. We need to treasure these older things and we need to, yeah. we need to try to understand what they're about and how they came about. Um, why was ha well, Hatsui's father the way he was? Like, why is he that way? Why is, why did he whip those boys in the bathhouse? 
because he's concerned for her well-being. Yes. Oh, is he patriarchal and mean? No, he's... He cares deeply. He's and, and he's not just getting her a husband. He's adopting a son. Like, the kid... Shinji is all in. And not only is Shinji all in, her father is all in on him. Yeah, so he takes his time doing it. He This is protective. Uh, if you'd written this novel now, if Shinji and Hatsui were were real and met in 2020, they would have they would have done everything that first night, which they never do in this novel. They would have done everything that first night. They would have broken their pictures and gave each other HPV. And then by page 30, they'd be broken up and sad. I'm glad I'm not young. How's that, for Pete Townsend? Yeah. I still think that these feminine and masculine virtues that Hatsui, I think, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and Shinji exhibit, I think they're, they probably still have their charms. Well, I know they do. And I hope that people read this and uh, they find it heartwarming and lovely and make them think about the way things are and uh, the way they were, and maybe the way they ought to be. I, I loved it. I'll read this book again yeah. and again, I think. I didn't know what you were going to think of it. I was really, I was really interested to hear if you. Uh, well, what did you think I would think of it? Well, it it um, it's so terse, and it's so sparse that that I wonder I wonder how much uh, how much trouble translation is introducing here. I don't know what you thought. I thought you were going to think, but I, I, I thought that that would come up. I thought that you might say that it's just a simple feel good story. But I mean, I mean, we're pretty, um, we're kindred. I, I kind of thought where you, where I, I knew where you were going to go, but yeah. um, this is probably one of the things that you and I both have gone the coldest into reading that we've done on the show. Mm -hmm. so, so I was really, yeah. I was just well, interested to hear what you had to there's say. There's an English version of this called Pride and Prejudice. Mm. <laughs> it's not exactly parallel, but the similar kinds of issues with family and tradition. And, and, uh, uh I'm mentioning this because we're trying to figure out what we're going to read next. We did this off camera. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're going to put pride and prejudice on the list yeah. for a couple of weeks from now. Uh, we're going to read, what are we going to read? Some Montaigne. Yeah. We're going to read, uh, Montaigne, uh, on the education of children and what is it on the affection of fathers for their children. Uh, we'll read that for next week and then we'll follow that with uh, pride and prejudice. My, my oldest daughter's reading Jane Eyre and she says it is a hockey puck and she hates it. And she said she would love to come on this show and deuce on that <laughs> with us for an hour and a half. <laughs> well, then I'd have to reread it. And I do not like that book either. I have my 16 year old daughter loves it. Right. I can't stand that book. I hate it. Our, our old our oldest daughters are uh, about as opposite as you get and still have the same <laughs> organs. It's pretty funny. So this book, yeah. Carl, I was reading I read a little bit about this book this morning. You know, I tried to never go to a secondary source uh until after I've read it. But Sound of Waves uh supposedly drew inspiration from the Greek legend of Daphnis and Chloe. Hmm. Which I don't know the slightest thing about. I have to refresh my... Uh, the plot summary. My Here it is from Info Galactic. Plot summary. Uh, Daphnis and Chloe is the story of a boy, Daphnis, and a girl, Chloe, each of whom is exposed at birth along with identifying tokens. Um, blah, blah, blah. They fall in love. Blah, blah, blah. Chloe is courted by two su suitors, two of whom attempt with varying degrees of success to abduct her. Uh, she's carried off by raiders. And meanwhile, Daphnis falls into a pit, gets beaten up, and is abducted by pirates. In the end, Daphnis and Chloe are recognized by their birth parents, get married, and live out their lives in the country. Hmm. Don't know. I'll have to go hmm. read a little of that, though. Maybe that's in Bullfinches or something. Go check that out. Um, I sure do like it. I will read more Yukio Mishima. I've got a thin little Yukio book here. I picked up at the uh, Anarchist bookstore we have here in town. There's a, we got this little bookstore. It's called Magic City Books, and it's mm -hmm. run by a nonprofit. And it's just full of just Marxist shit. <laughs> you know, do they sell bongs? They don't sell bongs. They, 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 no, they don't sell bongs. But if you want 
uh, a children's book about you know my three moms or, or something like that that they're your pl- they're your people. But they also have Mishima. But they also but they also I also picked up this uh, Yukio Mishima uh, Star is the name of it. It's real, I kind of I kind of look I like bookstores like that. Yeah, I, I, I like it all right. They had um, they had authors come in come and do. I don't know, a little Q and A, little presentations. You know how they do book signings? They talk, stand up, sit, sit on a stool, and drink water out of a little tumbler. You know how mm-hmm. they do? Like 170 of those last year, and they're they're on schedule to do even more this year. So I go, Charity and I go down there to go with the kids and see different folks talk about whatever. Uh, and I bought a I bought a Mashima book. I thought, do you guys understand that this is this guy's this guy's not one of you? Yeah, fun. Uh, please go listen to the Music and Ideas podcast. You can find that on iTunes. Once we get our fifth episode out, we'll be able to put it on Spotify. But it's already on SoundCloud, and uh, I think it's on Google Play and some other places. So go check out Music and Ideas podcast. That's Carl and me and uh, sweet Michelle Hawkins. I think it's a pretty good show, and it's just going to get better. And then, of course, go to onlinecreatebooks.com and let us help you get back to basics, guys. We need a, you know, we used to have cable television bills. You'd have a cable television bill; it'd be one fifteen a month. And then we unplugged from that, and then we got a Netflix one, and then we got a Hulu one, and then your Spotify professional, and then your uh, Microsoft uh, Gold. So you can play video games online, and I think we're I think we're at over one fifteen a month now. I think we thought we were saving money when we unplugged the phone from the wall, and we turned off the cable TV and went with our streaming stuff and our cell phones. I think, I think we're spending more than we used to. So you know, go unplug that crap. Yep. Go read some of these books, and if you want to, we'd be we would love to help you do that. Carl, have you seen? Yes. Did you see the curriculum that Connor? wrote for our calculus people at OGB? I haven't clicked on it yet, but we have a guy. (sighs) Can you believe this? The things that are happening in our little community, they're going to read math. I met Connor today on Zoom. Uh, Uh He's an OGB member, Online Great Books member. Uh, Young guy, he's just out of college. He's in grad school right now. He's a math, he has a degree in mathematics. And... um, so what well, he's 23 years old, something like that. And he joined us and he's been reading because his, his education has been all math and he's been reading with us. And he said, I sure would like to read some of these primary texts, particularly Newton. Mm, I just got chills. And, and, and I, <laughs> and I said, well, we, I do too, man, but it's going to be, it's going to be quite a while because of the, the, the way we do things. And he said, well, can I put together a group that does that? I said, man, you know, what resources do you need? Glad to help. Great friend Mm -hmm. so we put together a little slack channel uh mr warsham has hooked him up with some zoom meetings and our automations and stuff so everybody gets notifications and calendar stuff and blah 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 blah. he created a reading curriculum for them i'm gonna get teary it's 334 pages of primary sources from archimedes aristotle resume galileo fermat torcelli newton labnitz berkeley euler Mm. Riemann. Can I? I haven't even looked at that yet. But can I? I want to plug this a bit. So, if you, dear listener, hated math, there's a good chance you never actually did math. That for you, math was memorizing a formula, right, and plugging numbers into the formula, and that's not math. Trained monkeys could do this. We have them now. They're called computers. Math is seeing, for me, it's, I'm a Platonist in my soul. For me, it's the structure of reality that you're seeing. It's you're touching the good itself. Do you see fluxions? It's mystical, darn it. Do you see fluxions in infinite series, Carl? (laughs) I'm not sure there is such a thing as an infinite series. Connor's going to have to convince me on calculus. But uh, no, you might might have learned the Pythagorean theorem. So we have... um, Emmett Penny does Euclid for us. I wish I had uh, 48 hours in a day so I could do all of this stuff myself. If you go through the first book of the elements, you end up proving 
the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, that thing you memorized, you end up knowing it. Yeah, you Knowing it. it like you know anything. You could be on a desert island and forget it. And you could start, and having done it once, you could start with, well, a point is that which has no dimension. Uh huh. A line is a breathless length. Hmm. And you could get back. You could get back right. to it. And that's thrilling. And that's what math is. And it's absolutely beautiful. And if you don't think so, I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy for you, but if, oh, it's if you be hated brutal. math, I'd say 90% you probably weren't doing math. Yeah, Con- we're doing rote memorization. Con- Connor's Connor's class here is going to be brutal. <laughs> There's no question about it. Uh, but by golly, he's doing it. And uh, Connor, I hope you're listening. You are a hero to me. And uh, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. But that's the kind of crap we're doing. Yep. Yeah. Hop on board. Did we give the code? Uh, yeah, well, you go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast, and you can join up for our little VIP list. We send you stuff. I'll make it worth your time. We send you stuff. And then when it comes time to enroll, if you use the, the promo code OGB podcast, we'll give you 25% off your first, your first three months. And then, uh, yeah, go to, go to the music and ideas podcast and listen to that thing too. Cause, uh, we're trying well, well, listen, how many people juxtapose the two words, music and ideas? I, I think the whole damn concept is going to be really interesting. I was looking on mm-hmm. iTunes when Michelle and I were first talking about this, and there are music critics, and there are tastemakers. You know, there are people that recommend music, <sighs> you know, have a listen to this new thing or whatever, and there are people that critique. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think anybody else is doing what you and I do with these books with music. I mean, there are a lot of podcasts out there, and if you want to start a podcast right now, you're probably spinning your wheels. But I, I really think it's a unique, uh, a unique concept, and uh, I, I think it's going to have some legs. I'm, we'll see. I'm yep. proud of it. That's important to me. As long as I'm proud of it, I'll keep doing it. They've, pro- they've, all, they've all stopped listening, Carl, so it's fine. It doesn't matter. <laughs> The first show was Brahms, Third Symphony, and then on the 31st of March was West End Blues, Louis Armstrong's West End Blues, and then the April 14th show, I think that one will be coming out, is Chopin's Prelude Number 4 in E minor. Um, we'll be talking a about tasty that. Tasty little bit of music. Yeah. I haven't, I listened to that, but I haven't put my pointy hat on and sat in the dunce corner and really listened to it yet. Well, thanks for doing this with me, Carl. It's a delight. Likewise. Uh, let us know if there's anything we can do for you guys. Our little program will be opening enrollment again, um, I think that second week of April. Let me look on my calendar. Uh, the 13th of April will be opening enrollment again, and we would love to have you. And when you come, not only will we read these things, you might join Emmett in going through Euclid's geometry, Connor in his <laughs> epic... Uh, run through the history of mathematics up through uh, really the newest, freshest stuff there is. The, the guy, the guy came up with a comprehensive reading list. It's it's astounding. Um, Maliki's work on writing. I guess I'm gonna have to do my little dialectic one again, my little dialectic course, and then Michelle's how to listen to music course. All that stuff's in there. And if you're missing out, then uh, I hope you do it on your own. You could do it with your family, the brother you have trouble talking to try it out Mm -hmm. there's another show we'll talk to you guys next thursday 